Ancient civilizations possessed knowledge that has been lost to time. I think that's obvious. But to be fair, most lost knowledge is probably not practical to us today anyway. I mean, who cares what bacterial infection some ancient Swami cured with pine nuts and prayer when we can just use an antibiotic? And if some shaman or witch doctor discovered how I can make Windows not update the very second I start a Zoom call, well, I'd love to know that secret. But shaman are typically Mac people, so not a problem for them. But what about ancient technologies that would be of practical use today? Like levitation. Specifically, levitating large, heavy objects. Now that would be useful. Many people believe levitation, specifically sound or acoustic levitation, was how ancient civilizations like the Egyptians built the pyramids. There's actual science that supports this. Let's find out why. The ruins of several ancient civilizations like the Pyramids of Giza, Stonehenge in the UK, and many others are monuments constructed of massive stones. And the first question we have to ask is, why? Why use huge, ridiculously heavy pieces of stone when the same structures could have been made with smaller blocks, like bricks? Yeah, they were showing off. But we're looking at that question through a modern lens, based on the technologies that are available to us today. We do know that sound can levitate objects, and I'll get into how that works a little bit later, but current acoustic levitation technology can only move tiny objects with very little mass. Nobody's building pyramids at MIT. And if you are, awesome. Some researchers think ancient cultures may have mastered levitation through sound, which allowed them to easily manipulate massive objects. Hokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. Yes, the Jedi were an ancient culture, but let's look at cultures in our own galaxy. How the Great Pyramids of Egypt were built has been the subject of debate for a long time. Aliens. The fact is, no one really knows for certain how they were constructed. Oh, the aliens know. The mainstream theory is that it took a workforce of about 5,000 men and 20 years to build the Great Pyramid using ropes, pulleys, ramps, and cranes. And that may very well be the case, though I have my doubts. And if you guys want a whole video on the construction of the pyramids, let me know in the comments. There's a lot to cover about pyramids. For example, they weren't built by slaves. Aliens don't need slaves. Can we, can we cool it with the aliens for, for just a minute? <laughs> But let's talk about the 10th century historian Abul Hassan Ali al-Masudi. He's known as the Herodotus of the Arabs. And al-Masudi traveled all over the world, but finally settled in Egypt, where he wrote a 30-volume history of the world. Like everyone, he was awestruck by the pyramids. And he wrote a very intriguing passage about how the giant stone blocks were transported. First, magic papyrus was imprinted with symbols and placed under each stone. Then the stone was struck with a metal rod that caused it to slowly rise above the ground. The stone then moved along a path that was paved with other stones and fenced in by metal poles. The stone traveled along this path for about 50 meters, then gently settled to the ground. And this process was then repeated over and over again until the builders had the stone exactly where they wanted it. Now, some believe metal poles could have been used to create high frequency sound vibrations, which would have been responsible for creating the levitation effects. Now, given that the pyramids were already thousands of years old when Al-Masudi wrote this, we have to wonder where he got his information. Was this an oral history passed down through the generations, or just a great story created by a talented writer? Um, can I make a quick point? Go ahead. May I refer you to Clark's Third Law? Right. Clark's Third Law says any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Bingo. The Great Pyramid of Giza does possess some extraordinary acoustic properties and can dramatically amplify sounds at certain frequencies. So the Egyptians clearly knew a lot about sound science and how it could be used to produce powerful effects, possibly including levitation. Did striking the rock create vibrations that resulted in sonic levitation? Maybe the layout of stones and rods created some kind of magnetic levitation. The science for either scenario is sufficiently advanced and therefore to Al-Masudi and to us is indistinguishable from magic. Now the pyramids aren't the only ancient structures made of huge stone blocks. There are monuments around the world that contain stone components of such incredible size that they make the pyramids look tiny, but their construction remains a mystery. Let's look at a few more. The Temple of Jupiter at Baalbek, Lebanon contains the three largest stone blocks ever used in a man-made structure. Each block is estimated to weigh as much as 1,000 tons. 
Now, no industrial equipment in existence today could lift one, no super crane, and certainly no number of people, yet somehow they are positioned together so precisely that a sheet of paper can't fit between them. Now, nearby is an even bigger stone. It's known as Hajar El Hibla, and it's the largest piece of stone ever cut by humans. It weighs 1,200 tons. It's estimated it would take 16,000 men to even budget, and it would be a huge challenge of modern technology to just create it, yet, there it is. How did they do it? Nobody really knows. Let's go to the other side of the planet. On a remote plateau in Bolivia, 12,000 feet above sea level, there's a monument called Puerta del Sol, or Gate of the Sun. This elaborately carved megalith is a single piece of stone that weighs 10 tons. Cool. Well, how did it end up almost four kilometers up a mountain? And some scientists think that it may not be in its original location. And if that's so, where did it come from? Here's another. Namadal is an archaeological site on the island of Pompeii in Micronesia, and it's been called the Machu Picchu of the Pacific. It's the only ancient city ever built upon a coral reef, and the engineering of Namadal is so complex, nobody can figure out how it was built. The lost city dates back to around 200 BC, and it's made up of hundreds of stacked stone logs, each about three meters long and about a meter in diameter. The logs, which are stacked kind of like firewood, create walls that are 40 feet high and 18 feet thick. That's taller than a three-story building, yet each stone log weighs about two and a half tons. And the logs that make up the high walls, they weigh as much as 50 tons each. How they were moved and lifted into position is absolutely baffling. The locals didn't have pulleys, they didn't have levers, they didn't even have access to metal. This is Stone Age technology, so how did they do it? Well, the locals tell stories about giants who flew great canoes in the sky. Aliens. And those aliens, I mean giants, yeah. use some kind of magic to levitate the logs into place. Now, these are structures from very different and diverse cultures from all over the world. What was their secret? Well, these societies are so old that there is no record of how these structures were constructed. But in almost every culture where megaliths exist, a legend also exists that the huge stones were moved by sound, either by striking with a rod to produce acoustic resonance, or by instruments, or by simply chanting stones into position. Let's see how that works. For centuries, travelers from the Far East told tales of acoustic levitation. Some claim to have encountered mystics who possessed the ability to levitate themselves and objects using sound. One famous story comes from a medical doctor named Dr. Yall. He had been brought to a remote area of Tibet in 1939 to treat a Buddhist holy man suffering from an unknown illness. After spending some time with the monks, Dr. Yal eventually gained their confidence, and to show their appreciation, they performed a demonstration of sonic levitation that left the good doctor astounded. They took him to a meadow that was surrounded by high cliffs, and in the middle of the clearing, about 250 meters from a cliff, was a heavy slab of stone. Then the monks arranged 19 musical instruments, 13 drums and six trumpets, in a 90 degree arc around the stone and started playing. The other monks began singing and chanting a prayer, slowly increasing the tempo. During the first four minutes, nothing happened. Then as the speed of the drumming and the noise increased, the big stone block started to rock and sway and suddenly took off into the air and continued to rise until it landed on a hilltop about 250 meters above the ground. This demonstration was repeated multiple times for Dr. Yarl, who actually took film footage of this. What? Where's the film? <laughs> oh, that's confiscated and classified. Well, that's a piece of bullshit. I know. I actually found a paper that explains scientifically how this levitation might have actually worked. Link below. And if you're into geometry and geodetics, you're going to love it. Sounds moving. <laughs> you see what I did there? Ugh. <laughs> Another creation credited with acoustic levitation is the Coral Castle located in Florida. The Coral Castle is a sprawling stone compound built by Edward Lee Skalnan between the years 1923 and 1951. The complex is constructed of nearly 1,000 tons of rock, which Lee Skalnan somehow cut, shaped, lifted, and maneuvered into place all by himself. Just him. Now, FYI, he was five foot tall and weighed 100 pounds. It man! I ruined the moment, didn't I? 
Lead Skalden refused to allow visitors or observers on site while he was working, so there are no eyewitness accounts detailing his construction methods. Yet alone, working mostly at night, he was somehow able to cut and transport a thousand tons of rock to use for walls and towers. He also built all kinds of buildings and sculptures, all from giant pieces of stone. An obelisk he raised weighs 28 tons, and the largest rock on the property weighs an estimated 35 tons. Now, some of these stones are twice the weight of the largest blocks in the Great Pyramid of Giza. All this he did alone and without heavy machinery. The most amazing thing to me is the stone gate. It weighs nine tons and has about a quarter inch of clearance inside the frame. It's so well balanced that you could push it open with a single finger. And this is something that would be challenging for even the most experienced engineering and construction team. Yet somehow Lead Skalnin was able to do it alone. Oh, this guy definitely wasn't Union. Nope. Lead Skalnin never specifically identified sound as a key factor in his work, but he had an interest in radio and owned all kinds of sound equipment, which he used for unknown purposes. Now, no one ever saw him lift enormous objects, Though the story goes that spying teenagers saw him float coral blocks through the air like hydrogen balloons. I love this guy. I do too. I have discovered the secrets of the pyramids and have found out how the Egyptians and the ancient builders in Peru, Yucatan, and Asia with only primitive tools raised and set in place blocks of stone weighing many tons. He told friends ancient masters had developed a method for overcoming the force of gravity and that as a practicing Freemason, he was exposed to this knowledge through his contacts in that secret organization. This guy built an Illuminati sandcastle with magic. Magnets? He might have, with magnets or sound or both. I mean, there's actual science behind some of this. Now, unless you're in a vacuum, sound is everywhere. Sound is created by vibrating molecules of a medium, like air or water, into waves. The waves hit our eardrums or our skull, and our brain decodes the wavelengths into sound. We don't usually think of sound as having a physical presence, but acoustic waves can absolutely affect the environment. Think of a nightclub or a concert where you could just, you could feel the bass. Like that. Or how ultrasound is used to pulverize kidney stones. Or how singing the right note or wavelength with a sufficient volume or amplitude can shatter glass. There are even sound waves that can make people sick. We've got a video coming up on this, so hit subscribe, hit the bell, okay. like, share. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, hey, uh. <laughs> don't don't oversell it. I'm sorry, I, I, I get excited. Anyway, current acoustic levitation techniques use sound traveling through media, usually gas, to counteract the force of gravity. A basic acoustic levitator has two main parts: a transducer, which is really just the surface that creates the sound by vibrating, kind of like a speaker, and there's also a reflector, which helps focus the sound waves on the object you want to levitate. Now, to get this to work, there's quite a bit of math involved. For example, the distance between the transducer and the reflector must be a multiple of half of the wavelength of the sound. Now, this is because you need to get enough molecules lined up under the object in order to lift it. If you just blast sound at an object, all you're doing is scattering a bunch of molecules around, that won't work. But if we remember the story about the Tibetan monks, they were using this precise technique. They played specific instruments in unison, just like a transducer, focused at a specific object from a specific distance, like a reflector. I bet if we knew the actual sounds of their instruments, we'd see a correlation between the wavelengths they emitted and the distance to the stone. Now, I'm not saying the monks actually got this to work, but I am saying the science is sound. A pun? <laughs> no, 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 no. I <laughs> So terrible. Oh, no, no, I, I didn't mean to do that. It was... oh, shame on you. So now that we've seen that sound can be used to move objects, is this enough evidence to prove how the pyramids were constructed? For some people, yes. For most, no. For me, I'm not really sure. Could the pyramids have been constructed using pulleys, ramps, and cranes, like mainstream Egyptologists claim? Well, sure. But when you look at the sheer size those ramps would need to be, and the distances involved, the amount of materials required to build the scaffolding would be more than the material in the actual pyramids. Much more. So where, where are all the construction materials? To me, there seems like there's something going on here. But we can't even talk about this without being labeled kooks. 
Any challenge of established scientific dogma is labeled pseudoscience. Isn't that a bit arrogant? I mean, isn't pseudoscience only pseudoscience until it's actual science? But people are afraid to go up against the establishment. Kepler and Copernicus were ridiculed by their peers. Louis Pasteur's research was rejected by the medical establishment. Gregor Mendel, Nikola Tesla, initially they were rejected. Imagine the hate they'd get if Twitter existed. But that's a long time ago. Surely we've matured since then. <laughs> Think about this. In 1903, when the Wright brothers and others were building airplanes, the New York Times said manned flight would not be possible for one to 10 million years. Oops. And in 1985, the New York Times said no matter how inexpensive or powerful a laptop computer would become, nobody would want one. No boy. And when Apple announced the iPhone, the Times said they'd probably never build it. And even if they did, nobody would buy it. Aye, aye. And speaking of Twitter, here's what the New York Times said when it launched. Using Twitter for literate communication is about as likely as firing up a CB radio and hearing some guy recite the Iliad. <laughs> Whether the service could be made into a sustainable business, quite unknown. I'm skeptical. Blah, 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 blah. Haven't I always told you don't trust the media? You have. If you suggest that levitating heavy objects with sound or creating free energy is even possible, you're viciously attacked. Not just by Facebook and Twitter, but by the New York freaking Times. Aren't new ideas worth exploring? Did Steve Jobs care what people thought about him? Does Elon Musk care? No, they just went out and changed the world. So my message today is not to the corporate media or social media. They make money by getting all of us to attack each other. That's their business model. It's shameful and that's why nobody trusts them. Who cares? George Bernard Shaw said, all great truths begin as blasphemies. This message is to those blasphemers, to the recluse out there building castles with sound and magnets and his own hands, to the nerd in the garage tinkering with electronics because he knows in his heart there is a better way. This message is to the next Kepler, Jobs, Elon Musk, to the misfits and dreamers and visionaries. My message is to you. They are going to attack you. They are going to hate you. Ignore them. Keep dreaming. Keep building. Keep blaspheming. Because I can tell you with 100% certainty, the world needs you much more than it needs the New York Times. Thanks for hanging out with us today. My name is AJ, that's Hecklefish. This has been The Y Files. If you had fun or learned anything today, help me out with the algorithm and comment, like, subscribe, share. The algorithm is a Gorgon with hair made of venomous snakes that can turn you into stone. But with your help, we can defeat her. I eat Gorgons for breakfast. <laughs> Until next time, be safe, be kind, and know that you are appreciated.